you like have a look at the jacket first and then kind of take the design elements, interpret them? Is, is that how the process works? Um, it, it, really, it really depends. It depends on a lot of things. Um, one, it depends on availability. Um, generally, we, we tend to be just to work from screen grabs and stuff like that. If we're talking about replicating um, you know, things from film and TV, screen grabs tend to be the best. Um, obviously, if there's a costume display somewhere, um, it's best to work on that because oftentimes, even if there's, um, you know, we, we know who made the original for the movie, um, there's even a licensed version or there's a, maybe not a license, but they just keep making the same style, things like that. Um, there's things that creep in uh, that are not in the, in the movie or they've changed things for the movie. The costume designer will even sometimes change things themselves. So, you know, something gets made for them and they say, yeah, and they, they put their little touch on it, they tweak it. So we go, we try to go to the source in the sense of the, the film itself and uh, try to get as many of those details as possible. Um, and even in some cases, you know, we will have to translate it into real world because things they put into uh, movies maybe aren't as practical. They do it for, because it looks good or particular stunts or things like that. So we've even got that sort of debate as to, do you want it to look the way it looks on film? Do you want it to be an exact copy of what the guy wore? Do you want it to be what you think it looks like? Because then you have the whole the whole color issue, which is oh, that's such a great the bane of our existence. Right. Um, what color is it? It's just because uh... color in <laughs> film. I mean, like they'll even add like a filter in. I mean, Spectre most famously, right? There's a there's a kind of like a yellow hue that goes on exactly in the film. So yeah, I bet that's a bit of a minefield. Yeah, yeah, we uh, we've got. Uh, I mean, one of the, probably the, the best example is the uh, the jacket from um, Empire Strikes Back. You've got Han Solo wearing these two jackets, and the the one in the Hoth scene in the snow, and then his the one he wears in the cotton jacket in Bespin. And both we've always thought were blue. The toys we all had kids, they were blue, and then they finally got pulled out of the archives, and it turns out that the the parka is brown, and that the the cotton jacket is sort of a charcoal gray. <laughs> you imagine so you've just taken a match to an art, an entire batch of jackets and yeah it's, it's, it's insane so then you get then you get that yeah what are we gonna what are we gonna offer and uh, that's what's great about doing something entirely made to order because and that's what we always say to people look we do we'll do what you want and we have we've done we've done the like um quantum harrington jacket in neon green before you know so we've we've done it all so and we'll do it any way you want so we've done uh you know, the Van Helsing coat from the Hugh Jackman movie in, in purple leather with the yellow trim. So, you know, and we'll do it all kinds. So. Yeah, because I guess people might like the silhouette or perhaps might like the look of the jacket, but also have a favorite color as well. You That's know, right. They yeah. might want to put their own personality onto the jacket, right? Yeah, and it's, it's that um, sort of debate as, um, you know, are you wearing the jacket? Is it wearing you? Yeah. Um, are you dressing up as James Bond? Or are you, you and you happen to like the same kind of stuff James Bond wears? Yeah. So, and, and then putting your own spin on that, it you know, makes it you. That's quite cool. I think from my perspective, I'd always want to have things as close to the screen version as possible, but have everything being functional and practical. So like, for example, the, I know the Tom Cruise jacket that was in Jack Reacher, Never Look Back. I think that was done by Rod and Gun or Rod and Gun. And they had all of the studs and, metal fastens and press studs taken out which is as i'm sure you know quite common for stunt purposes and health and safety but imagine having a jacket with no zippers <laughs> no kind of <laughs> buttons to do your pockets up it would just be a nightmare so i'd, I'd probably have that jacket but have everything all the oh, yeah. bells and whistles right yeah yeah that's that's one that we come across a lot with the star wars stuff because in, in up until very recently one of the things george lucas put in was there are no zippers in star wars um, until Rogue One, there was never a zipper seen in Star Wars. And so you've all these jackets, they can't close. Right. And if they're closed, it's, they're, they're closed in a hidden way and they have no apparent fastener. It's, it's movie magic. If they get open, well, the fastener is gone now. So, yeah. you know, you get a customer who wants a jacket for daily wear, they're going to wear with a pair of jeans or something. And they say, hey, look, can you put in a hidden zipper? And then it gets that sort of challenge of we want it to look the same, but yeah, functional for everyday uh -huh. life. So imagine like a fly placket or something like that would come in handy. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's what we've done, sort of. Yeah, yeah hiding it under uh, little storm flaps or. Uh, but yeah. uh, luckily now with sort of the the new regime, they've 
sort of push that away and you're starting to see some fasteners appear in Star Wars making our life a little bit easier. <laughs> nice. 